Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, February 26, 2019 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Augusta, Georgia. Last week, Checkpoint disclosed a 15 year old vulnerability in the compression tool WinRAR. While not installed by default on Windows systems, WinRAR is still uh, quite popular and has sort of a significant following. Now, typically, of course, it's used for the RAR compression format, which tends to be more efficient and uh, more space saving than SIP. But the vulnerability that the Checkpoint uncovered is actually not related to the RAR format. Instead, it's related to another format supported by WinRAR, and it's called the ACE format. It's an other compression method, and yes, it's also supported by this tool as well as other tools. To make things uh, more complicated, the WinRAR developers actually, well, it's an old tool. They no longer have the source code for the affected DLL. So what they instead did is they essentially just removed ACE support from WinRAR and with that mitigated the vulnerability. So this happened last week, but today I saw a report by 360 Threat Intelligence, actually a tweet where they say that there are now some some mal spammed exploits that are using attachments that exploit this particular ACE vulnerability in WinRAR. A sample of the exploit code was submitted to VirusTotal. AV detection, well, it's sort of mixed at this point, and I would highly recommend that you expedite patching WinRAR. If you still need ACE support, uh, well, there are a number of alternative tools that will support this format for you. And talking about malicious spam, DDA posted the latest, greatest version of Sextortion. Uh, this particular campaign actually uses a QR code to encode the Bitcoin address. My guess here is that they're running a little bit out of victims here with these extortion campaigns. By now, I would think anybody with sort of a somewhat known spammable email address has received a couple copies already of this particular scheme. So the only chance that they feel that they can get you to finally pay up is to make it easier to pay. And that's why they add the QR code. Not really sure how much that'll help uh, if you have ever paid anything with Bitcoin. Really the initial setup of everything I think is really the hard part, setting up an account with some uh, Bitcoin exchange and such. Adding and entering that Bitcoin address in the end is uh, really minor uh, compared to that. One real tricky topic and that I've spent some time on in the past and it's sort of still my favorite topic is uh, the authentication to mobile web applications or web application in general, but in particular mobile web applications, of course, it's really tricky on a mobile device to enter a good password. And in general, of course, you know, passwords really don't work. Two-factor authentication hasn't really taking off the way it probably should take off. But there is a new standard that's up and coming FIDO2. So also WebAuth N is sort of a part of this. You may have seen that, that advocates passwordless authentication. And it has really quite a bit of promise with respect to the usability. But until now, one of the problems was you needed some kind of token for it, usually some kind of additional hardware device to make it work well. Well, uh, FIDO2 and Google made some interesting announcement today declaring that the Android phones running the latest operating system are now FIDO2 compliant. So what this means, for example, is that you can now use the fingerprint reader on your Android phone to actually log in to a website. Now, uh, one of course reaction I've sometimes seen talking about this is that people now feel that their fingerprint is being sent to various websites. That's not true. That's not how this authentication works. Instead, there will be a unique 
private public key for each website that you sign up with and your fingerprint will just be used on the device itself to unlock that key pair. If your phone doesn't have a fingerprint reader, then it will fall back to standard pin or whatever you set up for authentication for this secure storage. So the big promise here is that first of all, we no longer will have problems with passwords also because the phone automatically sends that key it will not send it to the wrong side phishing sort of is not an issue and i actually plan to do a webcast about this topic because there's really a lot to talk about here sometime in april and i'll announce here once i have a final date and time an ICANN is using recent news about attacks against DNS admin interfaces to make another push to convince organizations to finally implement DNSSEC. DNSSEC has pretty much stalled, in my opinion, over the last couple of years. If anything, it probably has somewhat dropped in acceptance, but don't really have the latest uh, numbers here and never really sort of reached critical mass, in particular sort of in commercial enterprises. The recent attacks often used administrator credentials to log into registrar accounts or accounts with DNS providers. And then these credentials were used to modify the records. Now, the argument put forward by ICANN is that if you use DNSSEC to sign all of your records, then of course, well, uh, any modified records uh, would get rejected. True, not true. In my experience, most of the time when you set up DNSSEC uh, with a particular registrar and I have the administrator credentials to log in for this domain, then the registrar will actually do all the signing for me. It's sort of nice. It makes it really more usable, but wouldn't really protect you against the attack where an attacker actually has admin credentials via phishing or whatever to log in to that admin interface. Well, that is it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.